You not to stop. Oh, I was almost going to ask you if you went to the Bordeaux one, Stu, but I, I um, let's share my screen. Here we go. Play from the start. Welcome to the Mosul. It says, like, Welcome to the Jungle or Old Guns and Roses song. But uh, you kind of see a lot of similar photos uh, when studying the Mosul, like just referencing these incredibly steep, like terrace, dramatic, like uh, slopes and landscapes. And I think this is just a great example of it. Well, what we're standing on here is, uh, I believe, the Erzsiga Words Garden, the vineyard of Words Garden in the village of Erzsig. And where it's almost like head spinning because, you know, we're facing downward, standing at the top of the slope. And what we have here is then the reflection of the sky off the Mosul below. And that most of these vineyards, um, as the Mosul, different from the Rhine River and how Rheingau was shaped. In our previous like part one class, Rheingau being this one almost like contiguous uh, slope south facing, but again along this river, the Mosul is a tributary of of the Rhine, where all this region is based upon. But as opposed to like one south facing slope, it's kind of western uh, flowing Rhine River. The Mosul it's shaped almost like a snake. It's winding in and out. And most of these top vineyard sites located on this river, uh, because it helps as a tempering influence, a rather very, very cold area, just to ensure the ripening of this fruit, um, kind of scattered in and out. But that might make more sense when we have a map here in front of you. Um, but then here, it's just like, oh, are you looking towards the sky? But it's just the reflection of down below with the river. and. Um, I think this is kind of a good thing just to kind of see how these vineyards are trained. It's not like these trialist vines uh, where they're trained up uh, above. I always think of like maybe a more well manicured uh, vineyard uh, that you'd see if you're touring an Napa site. You can't do that here. It's just these little stakes um, which these Riesling grapes uh, and vines are, are planted and kind of wrapped around. Uh, it would be too challenging, perhaps, uh, to try to create these like, uh, well trellised rows on these incredibly, incredibly steep sites. So when we we're standing at the northern uh, parts of Ursig, looking down on the river below, um, this is like a side view of where we were just standing. So it's pretty dramatic. They oftentimes kind of, I don't know if it's too much of a joke, but where there would be like uh, graveyards or like little cemeteries down at the bottom of the hills from um, people that, well, it's not, but it's just, it's very dangerous to work. <laughs> and uh, or maybe just to leave it at that, uh, which is pretty wild. And then this is just the bend in which uh, this Ursig uh, vineyard is kind of facing. And then just a slight overview. I mean, we'll look at the background and history. I know we touched on that a little bit with part one, so maybe highlighting some more specifics relating to the Mosul, but still kind of maybe brushing over um, these major points in history to kind of give us that backdrop and how this region is shaped, but always referencing ge geography and climate. Um, light review of the quality system, um, but really from there on, we'll just tour the major villages and vineyards, kind of moving north to south and the major bariques or departments uh, within the Mosul and then leave a few uh, slides towards the end um, to highlight. I, I kind of left it to one producer from these major breaks or uh, departments, but I think they'll be brought up continuously along the way. So as to become familiar with some of these major producers and how they shape the region. But here again, big picture, uh, Germany, just the country, and then the Rheingau where we left off where there was the Rhine River that essentially moves north up into where it would uh, eventually empty out and towards the Atlantic. But it takes this one sharp turn when it hits the Taunus Mountains and then bends, uh, say, east to west. And then again, where everything 
all these vineyards, just one single slope, all south facing before, again, the Rhine River, again, redirects north, again, moving up into what would eventually be the Atlantic Ocean. So where the Rhine River then comes is to Koblenz, it'd be like a little town here uh, where the Mosul tributary kind of meets and then uh, has its um, where it ends emptying off into the Rhine, Rhine continuing further north. Uh, Mosul essentially starts in the Boish Mountains in a region of Mosul, maybe a little bit farther south in the northern parts of France. But where we're starting, this is a good thing here too, before we get into the deep end, where Rangau, they have kind of a history, uh, they have wonderful sweet wines there, that completely exists, but maybe has a more of a stronger backbone with the dry examples of Riesling. Um, with the Carta or the Charta and that background, this movement towards dry styles. And even though Riesling just a light, refreshing example of wines in general, Rheingau usually have a little more power and weight in comparison to Mosul, which always is like the lightest, most delicate, prettiest examples of Riesling, uh, lower alcohol levels, and also a focus on dry styles. But I think if we had to generalize, Reasons from the Mosul, along with being light and pretty and elegant with low alcohol, just perhaps a little more power and weight to Rheingau, Mosul might oftentimes see a little bit where there's producers focusing on wines that have more of a touch of sweetness to it. Mosul touch of sweetness, Rheingau may be drier examples for trying to form strong distinctions. But we are at some of that northerly most latitude for growing grapes at 50 degrees. Uh, why we have this underripe fruit, giving us less sugar and less alcohol, uh, equaling uh, lighter uh, bodied wines, why that can be so elegant. Uh, but we're at a continental climate, meaning we have well divided seasons uh, winter, fall, summer, and winter, spring, summer, and fall. And there might be issues and worries of frost uh, because if you go further north than this, it's just too darn cold to even grow these grapes. Uh, this is what's giving our pure, light, um, precise uh, styles. And overall, I, I kind of like this here too. It's, it's not a terribly large area, about 8,800 hectares of vines that are planted. And then this is the major breaks and how we're kind of going to go from slide to slide, but it kind of breaks it down from the, this particular map with a number of plantings within these uh, major, I guess, sub departments or breaks. Um, if it helps to uh, kind of put it into context of other areas, Chablis is about 5,500 hectares uh, where your great Chardonnay is in northern uh, Burgundy come from. Uh, so not too terribly large, uh, just as far as amount of plantings. And the major soils, this is distinct. Uh, really, we have this slate rocks. It's like the stony, rocky soils here. Um, this is the blue Devonian slate that makes up the majority of vineyards. That's pretty much what we see through all of uh, Burncastle. And this is good, too. This is the major um, region they call the Middle Mosul. Um, as we move north, the river flowing um, south to north, where again, see this is the town of Copeland's where it meets the Rhine. Um, this is essentially the upper Mosul, the middle Mosul, and then the lower Mosul, just in the direction of the way the river flows. And we're at this top area, again, this is the majority of plantings, about 5,800 hectares. And then you can see, well, this is where all the top villages are located. That's essentially what makes its way onto the map here, a little pink area in the center. And then this is primarily where we see a uh, blue Devonian slate. That's the general makeup of most of these vineyards within these top villages. The other major soil, if it's not this blue Devonian slate, is this red slate. And we kind of see that kind of scattered a little bit throughout, but where we find it most often, is right around this tip of Ursig. And you hear contradictory things sometimes, but red slate usually giving more 
weight and richness to the overall general styles versus the pretty elegant examples that we would see from Blue Devonian Slate. And why this is good is again, again, where all these villages, you see, this is where we can kind of see the Mosul kind of winding in and out, almost like a snake, right? Um, as opposed to, again, Ryan God, I don't mean to keep repeating this, but where it's just all one um, hillside, self-facing along this Ryan River where it makes this sharp, unique turn east to west, where it doesn't really, otherwise it's pretty much just flowing north. That's quite different than what we have here, our winding snake-like river Mosul. <laughs> but in a rather cool area, the blue slate, it's wonderful for absorbing heat, uh, kind of tempering again the environment, ensuring a level of ripeness. And it's also well drained because there is a decent amount of humidity here. You get a higher average rainfall than what you'd see in other northerly Appalachians like Chablis. Um, so that's good where the soils don't get too waterlogged and that they're well drained. And that's always good to allow for those vines to grow their roots deep. Um, just become a more sustained, established fruit system. Um, and that also helps build concentration in the fruit and the overall result. The heat retention and then just well drained. And then with the red slate, giving you that power and richness um, near like Erzig and Erden. Erden is the other one that we'll see here in the map in front of us. Um, just again, fuller, more expressive wines. The Mosul River, um, again, submerges from the Boge Mountains, uh, which is just directly south from us. It kind of sh shapes the backdrop or the western parts of Alsace if we this map would continue uh, further south and extend beyond that. Uh, it flows eastward into Germany. And then if it's not these areas like Bergkoschum, Burncastle, the Middle Breek, where most of these top villages and vineyards are located, we have our southern Bariks here, uh, Ruhrtal, just right below this. Uh, Trier, this is a big one. This is one of our major Roman settlements um, that helped us establish this area and this backdrop history going back 2,000 years ago. But we can see the Ruhr um, just right underneath Burncastle uh, on tributary. And then our other uh, Barik, uh, the Saar, again, on this tributary of the Saar River. Uh, below that, Uber Mosul and Mosul Tar, uh, not very much planted in the far south. You can see only 123 hectares, just very little. And that's why there's not many wines that are introduced over here uh, in the United States. But I think this is where, like, we are going to still bring up these regions, but it's kind of these bookends where younger producers are starting to kind of refocus on these vineyards that were perhaps abandoned during the 20th century. And maybe the potential for some of the future of Mosul, I guess is what I'm trying to get to towards the end there. But incredibly, incredibly steep slopes, more than 60 degrees at some locations. And then frost, what are the vegetal cultural concerns when you're growing these grapes? Uh, that is one of them. You don't want your grapes to be frozen. And then here in like the 20th century, um, when people were replanting, a lot of them, and a lot of this has been ripped up now uh, as people refocus on a level of quality from perhaps more conventional farming in the 20th century, they would move into like the lower flatter lands and they would work with, it's not as big of a story here as it is in other in Boggy Beach or wine growing regions, but they would move into these like uh, crossings where um, they could, they didn't have to worry about too many viticultural hazards, frost being one of them. Like if it's a varietal like Mueller Turgau or things like that, but perhaps less of a story here than it is in other uh, areas of Germany. And then this is a look at the grapes. You know, Riesling is the real thing. Here we got a little typo there. Uh, but us recognizing that there are other grapes being grown here, uh, Riesling only being about 60% of them, and it always has a light florality to it. It's not, it has the same florality that Muscat has, but it's at lower levels. It's an aromatic compound called terpenes, but it's always a little bit pretty. Um, and then 
I think you can find a whole spectrum of fruit. Us describing that tartness is usually along that like lime or like green apple, but usually a sharp citrus. If it's beyond that, you usually find this like white peach or like apricot stone fruit category. Petrol, it's sometimes that's that diesel thing, that gas station note. Sometimes it's a light smokiness to it. You'll see it in wines of Mosul, oftentimes more with aged examples where that gas station diesel thing becomes more pronounced. Otherwise, if it were Riesling and uh, grown in areas such as Australia, sometimes Alsace where there's a higher heat intensity, uh, it's essentially this growing environment that would elevate this gas station diesel note. Here we're in such a cool area that that um, really isn't that strongly evident tell us wines that are age, Rieslings with age. But these are, why people love Riesling so darn much is because it is refreshing and that's due to the high acidity. It's that brightness, it's that crispness that allows you to want to kind of enjoy another sip and kind of constantly return to the wines. And it's also one of your best friends for food and wine pairing for that reason. Like if you ever have a dish that's using a little bit of citrus or like vinaigrette and just the sauce or the preparations, you can always match that with the acidity in the wine. So tartness matching tartness to it. And the other thing that it also has with acidity is that it's able to cut richer or fuller preparations. So if it's like a fat or a protein that brings this weight to the dish, acidity, if it's not tannins in wine, Acidity be, can be the contrast to that. It's a way of cutting that richness of other like fuller dishes and, and their preparations. Um, so it's incredibly food friendly and it's just incredibly refreshing. Why it can be oftentimes uh, not only sommelier's favorite wines as we learn about the wine world, but many others as well. But if it's not Riesling, it's this Mueller Turgau. See, this is a crossing created in 1882 by Dr. Hermann Mueller at the Geisenheim Institute. And where is Geisenheim located? He wanted to use chat in the Rheingau, right? Or a lot of people go to analogy school, kind of on the Western parts of the Rheingau. We can see that it was two varietals, this Riesling and Madeleine Royale, um, that were used to develop this grape. And why was it so successful or so highly planted? is because, again, less susceptible to viticultural concerns where it was earlier ripening. So if you ever had worried about frost and fall time, you already have your Mueller Turgal already ripened. So you have a, you can pick your grapes and they're all healthy and ripe <laughs> and high yielding. So you can grow a lot quickly. And um, again, in these lower line parts, if you were buying tractors and trying to farm mechanically, um, this is where you're probably trying to do that because otherwise these steep 60 gradient slopes, 60% gradient slopes, no tractors are being used there. Absolutely not. This is a fun one that we're going to revisit uh, kind of more and more throughout class. Elbling, and that might be one of the most unfamiliar grapes uh, or something new to a lot of us. It's only about 6% of the plantings and where we find that most oftentimes is in these lower parts or I should say upper Mosul, but just further south, um, uber Mosul, probably most predominantly uh, where Elbling makes its way. Just like simple and refreshing and easy drinking. It's almost kind of like a lighter Pinot Grigio if I had to try to like compare it to something. And we've tried wonderful sparkling wines made from Elbling along with that just because it's bright and refreshing. Pinot Blanc, um, Maybe a few scattering of different plantings. You can see that it's not very much, only about 40%. Uh, but it's interesting that Germany is the world's uh, leading grower of this varietal. Otherwise, I'd say that you'd find some in northern parts of Italy, like Alto Adige, perhaps some producers playing around with it, and like Alsace of northeastern France, again, neighboring region to where we're at here, also sharing the Vosges Hills where the Mosul River um, first originates. And then some Pinot Noir, you know, just our late ripening burgundy grape, our spat bug on there. Um, but first appeared in Baden from this gentleman, Charles the Fat in the late 1800s. There's a story prior to that where I think actually Charles the Fat makes its name, but uh, when Pinot Noir first appeared in Germany. And then Dornfelder, if it's not Pinot Noir, one of the red grapes, Dornfelder the second, and you can see another crossing 
um, developed a little bit later than our miller turgal but from these two varietals, Helfensteiner and Harold Rogue, uh, created by August Harold. A lot of this would be typically found in slightly warmer areas if it's not further south and just like little pocketed areas where they can ripen these grapes successfully. And then as you can see that it was just um, something that just increased in planning as early as just the 1990s. Um, so I, I've come across a couple producers and not necessarily always in Mosul. It's not really actually in Mosul, but other in Bogibi where you've been able to try a Dornfelder or two. Again, this is cool areas to all of Germany. So it's going to be kind of light, tart, uh, vibrant expressions of, of reds. But just to kind of give us another backdrop, um, maybe review from our first part in the Rheingau. In 16 BC, so Romans founded the city of Trier as a provincial uh, capital. And just to remind us where this is. So this is where the Romans first established this. And that was the earliest evidence of culti cultivation of vine in, in all of Germany. By the end of the third century, kind of the fall of the Romans, Empire. Um, viticulture was established in the Mosul. And this is the early, earliest evidence of grape growing. Uh, from there in the Middle Ages, kind of a similar history of what we see in Burgundy. Uh, a lot of viticulture was able to develop and grow uh, thanks to the church. Um, from them documenting vineyard sites in villages uh, with the establishment of vines. And, and what you actually see on on wine labels today, like the great Premier Cruz and Grand Cruz of Burgundy or Kartosserhof of the Rheingau, but they uh, kind of extended uh, from where they originated in Eastern France into these areas of Germany. And then we do see that documentation of vineyard ownership as early as the 600s or 7th century. 1435, uh, Riesling or Riesling first makes its appearance. And then 1775, um, this is some of our examples of late harvest or sweet styles uh, being purposefully made. Spat lace, discovered after making wine from grapes affected with noble rot. And we can remember where that happened in Rheingau at uh, Schlossschloss Hannesburg. And they also continued with like Oslo, they say, um, and even later examples of uh, sweet uh, late harvest wines. Baron also they say, Trock and Baron also they say. Uh, but a lot of that was actually taking place in the Rheingau. In 1786, Archbishop of Trier, Clemens, I believe it'd be Weckenslaus, decreed a, a mandatory shift to Riesling. So this is a, important why we just brought it up here is that, okay, grapes have been grown up here and cultivated for about 200 years. There was the influence of the church that kind of built and expanded. The more the Romans had left off, we have documentation of ownership. Uh, but this Riesling, the main grape of Germany, well, this Archbishop of Trier, um, this is, he actually made uh, a decree, this mandatory shift towards this varietal. So when does Riesling start to become the main grape of Mosul? A little over 200 years ago, in 1786. Late to 1700s, Napoleon defeats Germany and annexes all land west of the Rhine River. Um, so there is, takes on a, a similar um, fractionization of ownership um, that you also see in Burgundy, where you're in here, where um, parcels or plots of land are equally divided among inheritances. All church vineyards secularized, no longer owned by the church or the aristocrats, and then kind of auctioned off into um, private ownership. This uh, Napoleonic uh, fragmentation of vineyards also holds true um, over into Germany. In the 1800s, we have this golden era for German Rieslings. Um, yeah, we saw, uh, again, the sinking of the Titanic ship, but what was the most expensive wine at that time? It wasn't Bordeaux, it wasn't the sweet wines of Port. Uh, this, at the time, internationally recognized wines for quality, there's actually a, a Riesling from the Rheinheisen um, that commanded top dollar. Well, it's only just a little over 100 years ago. As there's this move towards quality, like post phylloxera places are trying to rebuild themselves. 
uh, we see the ver formation of what was the beginning of the BDP, but it was just at that time in 1910. Um, this is the point of that was just to have uncapitalized wines when they're making sweet styles. And then as we move into the 20th century, perhaps post-World Wars, advancements in technology, even with chemical fertilizers and sprays, more conventional farming, again, people moving into flatter lands, buying tractors, um, and again, mass production. And we have the rise of crossings, and then just that move quantity over quality. And here, German wine law, that point of this in 1971, was a way of reorganizing, condensing what was the result of this Napoleonic code where we had 30, up to 30,000 vineyard sites. And it was trying to simplify things and consolidating it down to 2,600. The way that they're at right now is that they have these single vineyard sites that got kind of lost in this consolidation process that a lot of the VDP are actually trying to uh, again, re-highlight on their labels and in their bottles. No, there was something unique about this site that this family owns, um, just like in Burgundy, that it produces a different style of wine than what you might see in a neighboring vineyard, even if it's like a slightly different aspect on the hill, further upslope, further downslope, at a slightly different angle, maybe it's more easterly facing versus southerly facing, um, that they, that they want to, I guess, re-promote and kind of rebuild back into what was perhaps lost in this kind of yeah, consolidation of vineyard sites. In 1980s, this is the lean pearl milk um, or, or blue nuns. It was these like mass produced sweet wines. A lot of them were based off Mueller Turgau. And now kind of why now a lot of these producers have to re-promote themselves from a way of the wines generally being looked at um, from this like mass produced like lead from milk and blue nuns that took place in the 1980s. And even though we get to try a lot of these dry, uh, dry, like dry styles um, and, and, and sweet styles, I mean, this lead from milk was just this mass produced like sweet, playable wine. And then the 2002, this is the BDP again, trying to reform their vineyard classifications and coming up with a system of like regional, village, premier crew and grand crew, uh, similar to what you find in, in Burgundy. And Spain and other places throughout the world are also trying to kind of come up with a similar form of classification. In 2000s, for many years, we were the largest cultivator of Riesling until finally overtaken by Falls. Yeah, this is the Mosul. Uh, very, until recently, we used to be the largest producer of reason in the world. And then this is look at that Pratacat system. This is pretty much, yeah, there's Qualitats wine, which is one of the top tiers. This is wine from any one of the 13 and boggy beets. That's our major regions uh, that were kind of shown on the first slide. Essentially any wine from any of these in boggy beets could be considered Qualitats wine. We're stepping stone towards level of quality, which is general regions. And then within Qualitats wine, you can label track and dry, have track and off dry. Fiend herb, similar um, translation to have, uh, have chalk and off dry, but just know that it have a touch of sweetness to it. I almost think of cabinet, kind of, um, <laughs> at a lower classification. Uh, Predicats wine, quality wine, right? At a predicate level, this is what the 1971 wine law, besides just consolidation of vineyard sites, they started to recognize or reward a level of quality based off of ripeness. And that was oftentimes associated with the level of sweetness, but not always the case, right? Like cabinet, you might pick the fruit, maybe early October, mid-October, spat, let's like, say maybe late October, let's like, say later and later into the season. Uh, these, all these sweet styles, you can imagine chalk and barren, I'll also say maybe pick like late November, early December. It's a rather risky process because these grapes are all being affected by botrytis, that noble rot. Where the small is like essentially dehydrating the fruit, concentrating in the level of sugars, but it could eventually turn into a harmful, uh, harmful rot and you might just lose your, the rest of the fruit from that year. Um, why so, uh, there's such a high price point behind it. And they're very, very rare. Um, 
sometimes we get into truck and barrel also say um, but ice wine where they might even wait until past december sometimes january what differentiates ice wine from these other late harvest styles sweet examples um, is that it's usually non effective. Um, so it's usually a little more pristine a little bit sharper because uh, botrytis does bring flavors and sometimes texture. It's kind of a soft peach fuzz, but it's usually it's, it's like honey and ginger and saffron, like flavors and notes uh, to the wine. There's a Trock and Baron Osley, say, sold by like Egon Mueller. It was a 2003 that sold for like 12,000 euros at auction, which is kind of fun, wild. It was, it was sold at, two, you know, kind of reviewing these areas, things that come to surface. Um, and kind of before, as you prepare for class, it's kind of wild that this truck and Baron Osley say from Egon Mueller, their famous Schartoffberg site cost 12,000 euros at auction, sold in 2015. And then um, what we had before, but another way of looking at our uh, predicast level and referencing level of sweetness, our Oxley scale, um, which is also protected um, by uh, German wine law. There has to be a minimum level of sugar uh, at ripeness, and that's what the oxalate scale represents. You kind of look at what happens with age, you know, or even botrytis it develops a slightly more golden hue, uh, develops higher concentration of color to it. Uh, it's not even just this botrytis for uh, age. And the gold capsule, I know that Amber had touched on this as well. I think where it's more commonly practiced is in the mosel. Um, gold capsule, like if you see an oslese, and then you see another oslese with this actual gold capsule seal, it's just, it's an indication that the fruit used for this particular bottling even had a higher level of sugar at the time of harvest. Sometimes maybe more of an influence of botrytis, but what you could expect when trying these wines, gold capsule will be a sweeter, richer, more concentrated style. And you might see, again, Oslice by itself, and you might see an Oslice gold capsule. So, oh, the one with the gold capsule again, richer, fuller, more concentrated uh, examples of wines. And then long gold capsule or large gold capsule, <laughs> longer gold capsule, even rare, even uh, oftentimes a sweeter, sweeter example. So like side labeling terms. Here's another look at kind of our uh, burn castle, our middle mosel, uh, with the major villages like Berden and Leipzig and Blonberg, and then um, the major vineyards within Sonnenauer of Wailing. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I might go back to this real fast. Um, we did talk a little bit about labeling terms and everything like that, um, or how to read a, term, uh, a wine label, amber. I don't know if we touched on this whole amplitude performance number, which is just like your testing number, but it's kind of wild what a German label can indicate and how precise it can be, where the number two, the first number, well, that's the testing facility where the wine is tasted and then approved and analyzed. And then five, seven, six, essentially the second group of numbers is the village in which the producer is based. So it'd be like well in. 576 and what that represents. 511, this third set of numbers, this is specific to the producer. 32, this is the specific bottling. And that means that this is um, the bottling of Willemer, Son and Nauer, vineyard of this village, and the spat they say level predicate. That's what this 32 is, the specific bottling. And then 98 is the year that it was uh, tested and approved which is essentially usually the year after the date of harvest, the vintage of harvest. It's just a, how, pre, how precise these can be and what else can indicate. Herzeger Abfeline just means a state bottle. <laughs> That's our VDP logo, our eagle that holds the grapes. I'll bring that up again. I'll just skip past that real quick. I don't know, I don't mind bringing this up. I mean, here we have our recent flute bottles they eventually just kind of developed that way because it was an easier way of storing and shipping on a less 
uh, kind of uh, like an easier, more gentle ride along the river as opposed to when you're shipping these wines in the more rough Atlantic Ocean uh, that you can allow for this packaging and method of shipment. But different ones say it's the Rango, usually in just the color of the bottles, you have this brown <laughs> glass used for Rango or Mosul, which we see here with Fritz Hogg, is a green shaped, a green colored flute bottle. And then before we begin our journey uh, north to south through the major Greek, another quick look at the BDP system versus, which is again just a growers association that's dedicated to level quality but most producers are, are part of this association but not officially recognized by German wine which was established in 1971. So it's just a growers and organization again you'll see it with the seal the eagle clasping onto this grape cluster what it represents and it's usually just like lower yields um, higher density of fruit lower yields higher density fruit. Usually it's a focus on more uh, indigenous varietals, so you're not probably complaining to more international grapes, but a few things that um, these growers are dedicated towards, uh, widely accepted and by many manners, not technically approved by German wine law, just making sure I'm not missing anything. And then this is, before it, Anyway, just go step by step. Gross Gavox are great gross. These, this is an indication of dry wines from Grand Cru or gross logs like sites. And then what that may, to extend on that, this is our, our pyramid of quality. Grand Cru, Premier Cru, uh, village, and then just regional. Maybe another way of looking at that could just be like your BDP labeled as Mosel, it'd just be regional Gutswein, just like Burgundy would be Burgundy as if the grapes would be coming anywhere within the Mosel region. And then we move into site specific. Wurzwein, now we're at least in a specific village. An example of that would be Peaceport. And then we might be highlighting a top vineyard, uh, which would be like a Premier Crew or Erslag. This isn't practiced in every unboggy beat and in the Mosul, you won't see that here. It would just be moved from village level into what would be considered your Grand Cru site or gross log, the highest vineyard designation. Uh, puts Earth log next in there, so very nice. But just know that it's not maybe practiced by every unboggy beat within uh, Germany. Mosul would be one of them. And if it doesn't say trocken, going indicating dry, I mean, if you see GG on a bottle, because this isn't an officially recognized legal term by German wine law, Groskevox, you'll see GG. And that would oh, that would only that would be the only thing that would appear on the label. So you know that GG would be a wine fermented dry. And then it has to come from one of the top gross log or Grand Cru sites. So all of this Grand Cru, Premier Cru, Village, Regional uh, was put into place by this growers organization in 2012. So let's back up to the Mosul. And we're gonna continue on. There are breaks. And we're gonna start maybe flowing opposite of the direction of the river, but we just moved north to south. And I think that's a good way of approaching it. Again, just beginning in Berg Koshen. Remember this village up here, Wenningen. So we're gonna see Heyman Launstein that's based up here. And then Zell, this is kind of like the marker towards the bottom part of our Berg Koshen. It's an area that used to be much more widely planted. And it's actually some of the steepest areas in all of Mosul, these crazy terrace slopes, where again, it actually takes on another nickname if it's not just lower Mosul. Again, just in reference to the way that the river flows. Um, again, terra, it's also known as Tross and Mosul, or Berg Koshen, and that's because of these crazy steep terrace slopes in which these vineyards are located. And 
and originally built by Romans 2,000 years ago. So a lot of history behind it. It was really just like post phylloxera and world wars that, I mean, it's kind of like, this is one of the Heyman Lowenstein quotes, smart kids from Winnegan, they moved to Koblenz. I mean, cause that's where people can earn a living and, and, and have a career uh, for you to stay in these uh, vineyards. It was incredibly difficult work and you might not actually be able to sustain yourself or actually have a prosperous life. And so your alternative was to maybe go work in a factory at the nearby largest city. city. So why these areas perhaps fell to the backdrop to other major villages that might have had a stronger historical background um, within the rest of like Burnt Castle. Um, highest percentage of Riesling in all of Mosul, uh, minority of top sites, and then just curse downstream from Zal to Colburn's, just kind of what we mentioned. Uh, lowest percentage of flat land workable by tractor. It's not a lot. I don't think we'd see much of any of it. Um, commercial disadvantage, forgotten for nearly a century. And it's these producers, Heyman Lowenstein, uh, Clemens Bush, uh, that decided to stick around and work these crazy vines um, that now are starting to uh, populate again in like restaurant wine lists and even retail shelves. Um, no, this is this exciting young guns. Like what we're highlighting in the uh, kind of tail end here with some of the major producers have that historical background and that influence, but it's when it's these smaller like import portfolios that are introducing new winemakers of the Mosul they're often kind of, again, like I said briefly, they're coming from these crazy steep terrace slopes of Berg Koshen, or they're playing around with these Alpine coming from further south in the Uber Mosul. That's where a lot of these younger growers are uh, kind of located and are the come ups, I suppose. Uh, I guess we see a little bit of blue developing slate. So I'm eating with some red slate. Red slate giving you that power and that richness uh, in contrast. And then Winningen, the one furthest north. This is, there's one famous vineyard uh, within Winningen, and that's Ulan. And you can see that in Heyman Mountain's label. And uh, they're kind of an interesting producer because uh, Reinhard Heyman Mountain applied for Germany's first three single vineyard PDOs. So it's not even just like recognizing like an Umbogi Bee or a Prada Cat or the VDP's own thing. Village Regional Premier Crew Grant Crew, he's actually he's actually applying through German wine law to have single vineyards recognized um, within like it's like single parcels, and these are some of them: Blaufusserle, Rothle, and Mulbach. So you'll actually see that um, as individual bottlings through Heyman Lauenstein, but it's just not officially recognized, but how he chooses to uh, make and release his wines from these single plots within the single vineyard because they find them to make wines that are distinctly unique. And then again, the Heyman Lauenstein. Clemens Bush is really popular. He makes a lot of really dry styles as well. You can imagine him being really sharp and really lacy and really bright. And look at this, isn't this nuts? So this is winning in. And these aren't even some of the steepest slopes. If you want to kill some time and kind of look up something on your own right now, one of the steepest vineyards in the whole world, that's that, yeah, wow, is right. Check out Bremer Kalman. Well, that, on my invite for tonight, I was like, what is the vineyard picture here below, which they consider to be the world's steepest vineyards? It's actually up in this Berg Kosham area. And it's called Bremer Kalman. And that was the picture that I saw. I that I had on uh, tonight's Zoom invite, but pretty nuts. So you can imagine like, if you're, I mean, how much wine are you actually gonna be able to produce? So it's kind of like a labor of love. And then you can see these like Mongol rails that you just have to like ride up and down. It's kind of like this crazy, scary roller coaster just to pick these grapes, just to make these wines. And this is like, it's nonstop. And then this is Wieser Kunstler. You can see um, Steffensburg. This is one of the major villages where Wieser Kunzer is located. So like Clemens Bush and this Wieser Kunzer, these are delicious, by the way. Like this is like a, this is like a 
15 20 dollar wine that's like a fiender bottling so you know i have a touch of sweetness but such like a fun like bring to the pool or like picnic in the middle of a hot summer day just so refreshing but look at them trying to work these sites this is absolutely nuts right just the work and the labor that goes into this you can see why not everybody's just jumping on board to like well i'm gonna go do this too i mean especially if it's like challenging for you to find distribution and even sell these wines when you're not in maybe this like historically famous site like who the heck knows uh, what Winnegan is if it's not attending a class like today right and then uh, this is Wall and Wider uh, remember this Wolf the village Goldrub the vineyard so Goldrub vineyard of ER the village of Wolf we'll bring that up in a second Wieser Kunzler this Clemens Bush again in in, in Berg Kosham sorry I didn't think he's sick um, they're just located further south where Heyman Launstein is up here, uh, Clemens Bush, Wieser Kunzler, uh, all a little bit further in the southern parts of the Burke Ocean. And then we're going to get into Burncastle. Stephensburg, I'm moving my chat around a little bit. Um, I believe this is actually what we're looking at here because. Um, Wieser Kunzler, I believe, is based in this end cartridge. I think uh, Stephensburg is what we saw on that previous label. And then when we move into Burncastle, following the Mosul as it winds around, um, this is where Wallenweider is located. Remember, Wolf. And Goldrub is like right here, the vineyard site of this village, where this top producer is, is located. Or newer producer and this is just kind of on our tour like we'd stop by if we follow down this is these crazy steep slopes we saw the steepest vineyard in the world bremer Kalmont. not here but in our invite and now we move past that and make it into the village of enkert and then you can see batterbeard eller group not all of them listed here maybe just to keep, keep it moving on starkenberg uh, not on the map but this is Traben, uh, Trabach. To Wolf or Ballen Wider is located, and then Gold Group. That's one that we've had on our list from time to time. So, you know, it's not just totally like rare and difficult to find. Crow or Crow. And then you can see similar vineyards sharing a vineyard sharing a name, similar name, Stephensburg, same name. Might be kind of peppered throughout the region. So, we have two, and then Kinheim, and then Rosenberg within Kinheim. Again, maybe vineyard sites from these villages that might start to appear uh, or become uh, available to us here in the United States. But if it wasn't these kind of lesser known <laughs> villages and vineyards and our twist and turn, um, really the dramatic landscape kind of continues back when we get into our bold villages, Erden being one of the most prominent. And then this little neck, or this little turn with Erden and Erzig, this is where their red slate really becomes the main name of the game uh, with where these vineyards and how these vineyards are made, um, built. So you know, like if it's a wine from Trepkin, which is a little bit larger, 36 hectares, and Pralot, Pralot right next to it, you can see much, much smaller, only two hectares. Both of these vineyards located in the village of Erden. Well, I've never had this wine before. How do I know? How is this going to differentiate from something down here like Wailing or Stelting? Well, this is Red Slate. So I know that Red Slate usually produces wines of more power and richness. So I would expect this to represent that versus maybe the lighter, more elegant styles from Blue Devonian Slate and these other major villages. When you try to break down the nitty gritty here, besides Prelat being a little bit smaller, um, they say that this is one of the warmest regions in the Mosul versus Trepkin, which is slightly cooler um, as a larger neighbor to its Western Prelat, the warmest. And then Ursig, our spice garden, can, again, a slight continuation of our red slate soils, rather large slate, but that's where we began on those crazy steep slopes. <laughs> and then where our, our first slides began, 
but again, um, probably a photo you'll come across from time to time. Um, if you enjoy wines from this village, and this is all Erzigar Works Garden, kind of, and you can see where the Mosul River bends around. So this would be the town of Erden, and then right across that village, that's where you'd find uh, Prelot and then Trepkin. Up through that, that's where you might meet up with Paul and Whiter and things like those lines. As we keep moving on past our red slate soils of Erden and Erzig, we get into this is all famous stuff. Right? We kind of moved away from like these lesser known areas as we began our um, travels into the Brian Castle region. And we get into like Zeltingen and Whalen, uh, where we have our famous sun in our vineyards, which means sundial. They actually built a sundial into the hillside so people could know what time of day it is. So they had an understanding of how much longer they would have to work for that afternoon. It's actually sundials built into these vineyard sites uh, for both Zeltingen and Whalen. And they also have a sun and our vineyard down here in Braunberg, or Braunberg, further south. Some of the major producers uh, located within these villages, Jojo's Prim, one of the main ones, Dr. Lucen, and they'll have kind of holdings throughout. Uh, but when we get into Whalen, this big stretch of land, and this, you can kind of see on the north bank of the river, these are all south-facing sites. And that's, that's necessary, again, to ensure a level of ripeness. Once we move past our sun and our vineyards of the Zeltingen and Whalen villages, uh, we come into Grok. And they say that Grok uh, produces slightly earthier, like more rustic examples. One, there's the World Atlas of Wine. They kind of generalize these styles, rock, earthier, richer than perhaps the elegant, delicate styles that you see from Whalen. I think a lot could be based off of like producers styles and even um, Pratikat, you know, levels of ripeness. But we come into Dome Pros, probably the most famous of the vineyard sites within Grocker. Um, and even Joseph Hopper, this is a, a, it's actually a monopole where it's only one owner, uh, and that's Reichskraft von Kasselstadt. Uh, and we move into Grocker and Hemmelreich. And as we keep moving past our famous south facing slopes of Zeltigan, Whalen, and then Grock, we get into this little current turn or bend in the river uh, where we have the village of Burncastle. And within Burncastle, the town of Kews, we have the famous Dr. Vineyard. And when they consolidated vineyards in 1971 with the German wine law, they mandated that the smallest your site could be was five hectares. If it was less than that, it would just be, again, uh, merged with a larger uh, overlapping vine or larger vineyard site. Uh, but there are certain vineyards that were so famous that were smaller than that required five hectares. Uh, the doctor vineyard being one that was able to um, retain its name because this is only like a 3.5 like 3.8 hectare site this doctor vineyard but supposedly this bishop would fall fell to a fatal illness and everybody had visited him with certain cures and remedies it was only until he had drank two bottles of Riesling from the famous doctor site that he was cured of his illness so hence where it took the name the doctor vineyard that cured this bishop in this storytelling. But really it's one producer um, that strongly comes to mind is um, Thanish. Um, that, but it's only two producers that actually hold holdings in this Dr. Vineyard. Just east of that, you have the Bad Stoop in Dr. site. And you just keep coming around. We have the Leaser Village and then Braunberg, far below, uh, where we have Jufra and Jufra Sunnenauer. And I'm gonna re-look at that later, but kind of a north, um, almost like satellite image where you can see like, oh my gosh, we come through Ursig, and then we get into um, Zeltingen and Whalen and Grok, and then this is where the Doctor Vineyard or Braunkastel Cues, and then we wrap around to like the Braunberg, where we also have another Jufer and Jufer Sun and our, and then this is Whalen, isn't this what? So again, you see these single stake posts and how they train these vines, and then you can see the sundial actually built into the side of the wall. And then just another kind of closer look at that. 
and a couple examples of some producer labels like Dr. Lucen, who we mentioned before. And then, yeah, super cool. And then this is Joe Dolph Christoph Urban from Usaga Words Garden and there's Spatle Sebano. You can see these kind of cool like images in the backdrop and labels. Like Dr. Thanish, you can see you know, how that's kind of pictured. The doctor vineyard on the label here too. Kind of wild. And then <clears throat> I'm gonna try to speed it up a little bit just because I don't want to keep, keep you here too long. I'm still trying to give this material amp due, but um, once we move past Braunberg, now we're getting into this area, still in the uh, Burncastle uh, Borik. The next major famous village would be the Peaceport. And in Peaceport, we have this um, vineyard called Gold Truck, and which is our droplets of gold. Rather a large slate. It actually extends from like all the way over here to like over here, um, 66 hectares. And there are two uh, producers that have this historical background and some of the larger holdings, Reinhold Hart, and again, this Reichskraft Boston. Kasselstadt. They talk about this like when there was this consolidation of vineyards, uh, it's kind of confusing because you might have this like Peace Porter Gold Tropping, which is a little site specific. So you know where it's coming from. And it's this historical site, all south facing from this village of uh, Peaceport. But then there's this larger uh, Mickelsburg that extends much further. I think it's like all the way from like Trittenheim to Meenheim that this Mickelsburg represents, but it would be labeled Peace Porter Mickelsburg. Well, I don't know that Mickelsburg is a larger gross log in, like larger encumbrance in site than what Gold Trop can, much smaller single vineyard site, even though that this is still relatively big, this is much more expansive. So it's just like, it's the example that's brought up when you're reading German uh, labeling, although it can be precise, it can also be a little confusing and a little misleading unless you're completely aware of what um, these vineyards uh, represent, if that makes any sense. But we have our famous droplets of gold made by uh, Ryan Holhart and Reich Scrap von Kasselstadt. And then just moving into some of these other like drone, maybe more clay and iron rich soils, producing bigger examples. Trittenheim moving further south, a couple of famous sites within that, Apotheke is one of them. And then moving again, like maybe more of a stronger extension of clay, richer examples, not as much perhaps blue Delvanian slate. Uh, Lewin, again, just single vineyards without, uh, perhaps a lighter or more mineral example than neighboring Trittenheim. Us just trying to give you generalizations of styles lighter uh, Lewin versus Fuller Trittenheim uh, when we're learning about these villages. So now we move past the Burn Castle and we get into some of our Southern Breek and then Ruhr, pretty small, um, right along the Ruhr tributary. And it's not a lot, it's like only like 120 some hectares. It's not a lot, it's more than that, but it's not much more. Ruhr and Sauer, where we're moving after this, this is only 11% of total Mosul production. It's kind of, so when you move further south, you might think that it would get a little bit warmer because you're moving closer to the equator. But what's, what we find here in Ruhr and even the Sar, just right below with this, is at higher elevation. So these actually Southern Barik are actually producing even lighter or mineral, uh, lower alcohol examples of Riesling. Just light and bright and crisp and pristine. Um, it is a smaller tributary than what we used to see with the right, uh, the star. It's only about 30 miles. Strong focus on Riesling. I think this is also a, um, an example of how cold this region, or perhaps other varietals, would not be able to survive. Riesling, again, is incredibly winter or cold hardy uh, grape. But when we're looking at the two couple major villages, we have Eitelsbach is one of them, and we have Mieterstorf as a second. In Eidelsbach, we have this famous Kartosserhof bird um, vineyard site. And this is uh, an example of our origin of during the Middle Ages, um, what is established during, uh, from the Cartusian monks, about a 19 hectare estate, Kartosserhof bird. It actually means Cartusian, the name itself. So it's the site and it's also the name of the producer, Kartosserhof. When we get into Mietersdorf, um, there's this Apsberg 
which is actually right across from this. And this is a, also has monastery, it's also a monastery um, since the 900s. So again, over a thousand years of history, but again, historical references. This isn't like Clemens Bush, this young gun up in the Northern um, um, Berg Kolsheim, right? These are established wineries that have hundreds and hundreds of years of history that are still producing wines um, still to this day. So we have uh, Kartosov Berg, Kartosov producer uh, based in Eidelsbach. And then we also have within the village of Mietersdorf, our vineyard of Asberg. Um, that's from this Maximin Groundhouse Monastery. And though with those origins, it's currently owned by the von Schubert family. That makes sense. Just, just remember Ruhr, uh, lighter examples and why, because it's at higher elevation and that we have these established wineries, um, Kartosserhof and then even uh, Maximilian Greenhouse, currently owned by the von Schubert family that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. And then this is again, us maybe backing up and kind of seeing again uh, where these, where, where the Ruhr, tall Ruhr is located. Then just overall producer labels, like when we're looking at Gold Trocken, our Peaceport, this is Reichsgraf von Kesselstadt, Weinhold Hart. Again, this hundreds and hundreds of years of history, along with our Maximin Grunhaus that goes back to the 900s. But this one is our one that's located in the Ruhr. Hello. And then right underneath the Ruhr, so again, we're gonna be moving into the Saar. After the Saar, the Uber Mosel, and then there were, see about only 180 hectares. So pretty tiny. This we're getting about to 773 hectares. So a little bit larger in size. There's one major producer. I've heard enough, I've heard a lot. What should I remember about the Saar besides being one of the coolest areas in all of the Mosul? Why? Because of these high elevation sites, less protected from the cool northerly winds. And it was kind of wild that even in the 60s and 70s, because it was so cold, they might not only have gotten like three or four successful uh, harvests a decade. It's much different now. Within the last 20 years, um, they've been able to ripen their grapes um, successfully vintage after vintage, but wasn't the case 30, 40, 50 years ago, which is a little bit wild. But there's one uh, producer that we should certainly mention, uh, remember, and it's Egon Mueller. Why I bring that up without Egon Mueller being just on the side is because we're actually standing on the top of the hill of Schartshofberg within the village of Woltingen, looking down at the Egon Mueller estate. And then what, what it might look like if we were to go tour their vineyards, although I think that's pretty rare, um, is what it might actually look like in the cellars. So cool site, high elevation, Schartshofberg vineyard within Woltingen, and one of the top producers is this Egon Mueller. I think that's important there. And then these are some villages a little bit further south, Washington, uh, Kansan. Maybe we bring this up a little bit. Um, so this is like, this is the tributary, kind of bends a little bit, but essentially runs north as it runs into the Mosul. Again, a little bit longer. We have about 130 miles here, right? This is only 30 miles of the Ruhr. And as it uh, kind of makes its way down, it's hard to tell, but this is all taken from the Atlas. This is Schartoffberg. So it's about a 28 hectare site. Egon Mueller owns a majority, well, a good portion of it, about eight hectares. And it's a little distance away from the river here, but it's all still south facing. And then they actually have a little parcel up here in Kansan, um, where it produces wine under this Galais label. And then when I brought up those other ones, maybe I'll wait a second, because there's Isle, Isle and there's Isle Coop, where there's this uh, producer. Uh, Peter Lauer, and that's where we're located. And even, even when we get down to Saarburg, there's this one vineyard site called Rouge. But moving south, uh, this is the Egon Mueller label, the Schartshoff burger. Remember, there was one that was sold for like 12,000 years. This is a Trockenberg, as I say. And another look at labeling. Zillikin, so this is the producer. Usually these are sweet examples because they hold on to that level of sweetness to balance out the sharp, sharp acidity from these dramatically cool areas. So most of the examples that you see from Saar, besides being just the most pristine, the lightest, the 
the most elegant. They oftentimes are usually making sweet examples, but this is where raw uh, silicon is based in the Starberga Rolsch vineyard site that we see on the label here. Another producer of Schatz, Schatzhofberger is this Van Volksum. And what differentiates Van Volksum versus Egon Mueller, known for their sweet examples, is that Van Volksum focuses on dry styles. And this is Peter Lauer, based on the Eiler Coupe, which is the Eiler right over here. They do make some wonderful fiend herb, like slightly off dry examples, but again, a departure from the Lauer family versus the other major producers, Egon Mueller and Silicon, is that they focus on dry examples. I'm keeping you here for probably another couple minutes, but we're almost there. So I hope you're doing okay. Um, right underneath the SAR, where we just hung out in Schartzhofberger and tried to find some from Egon Mueller. We went down to Roche, Sarberger, where we had mines of Zilligan. Zilligan. Uh, we're now into the Uber Mosel, Mosel Tur, which is again just the upper Mosul, just where the Mosul originates in France. And it kind of marks, you can see Luxembourg. This is all a French border right on the other side of it. So these are all on the right uh, bank of the river or essentially the Eastern parts. And then you get them away from, again, these crazy steep slopes into slightly more gentle uh, hillsides. And that we move away from Blue Devonian Slate because this is an area at a similar latitude than we'd see in like Chablis and like Champagne. And it was an area all once underneath this Paris basin where uh, it was slightly more uh, dominated by like this limestone calcareous soils. And what are the main grapes of Champagne and Chablis? Uh, things like Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but other Burgundian varietals or varietals that have similar Ancestry, I suppose, Pinot Blanc being one of them, or other Pinot bridles. So this is where Elbling begins to appear, Pinot Blanc, Oxra, Riesling, like kind of like you know, Als Alsatian bridles, where it might be slightly warmer, less dramatic landscape, and a move to these like limestone calcareous small so calcareous small soils um, that share a similar backdrop where how did that come to be is because it was all an area once underwater this Paris basin similar to like Champagne and Chablis and this like a tiny little like notch botch here towards the very end here um the smallest multiple reek and again just maybe a more of a focus on this um penal variants penal breed penal blanc chardonnay and reason so this last few slides here this is really like if I had to pick a couple top producers from some of these major uh, breed, Jojo's Prune is one of them. And then this is the Whalen, uh, hill, the Whalen Village. I think more standing on the eastern parts and then looking back. And then this is um, Katerina, along with uh, Johan Joseph, uh, Johan Joseph Prune. Her father is pretty much just run by Katerina. So I have a podcast I can share with them later, but kind of standing on the western part of the hill and then look at, looking in the opposite direction from this top photo. You can see the family has lived in this area since 1156. That's true. Like these families have lived and inhabited these areas for hundreds and hundreds of years. So they've known each other for a long time. They've been neighbors with each other for a long, long time. Um, but even though they've been around for so long, they only founded the uh, actual estate in 1911. Um, but it was this Johan Joseph Prum. It was an offshoot of the original Prum estate, which was known as S.A. Prum. So you'll see S.A. Prum, Jojo Prum. Jojo is probably the most famous for the departure from the original family estate. Uh, Joseph, jo Johan Joseph, the son of Matthias Prum, whose ancestor, Jodokas, bear with me, he actually built, so an ancestor in this Prune family was the one that built the actual sundials in the Wailinger and Zeltinger hillsides. So those pictures that we were looking at that you said super cool, it was their family ancestry that actually built those sundials, which is kind of wild. And this is Manfred, it's not Joseph. I knew I was not saying that right. But it's primarily Katerina, the current generation who joined her father in 2003. You can see that she's fourth generation. And then again, known for some of the sweet wines, we talked about the gold capsule, um, but it's just about not necessarily one being better than the other. They just represent different styles. 
And like many of these producers, they are members of the VDP. I look at their total vineyard site, kind of wild. And this happens when we talk about phylloxera on this crazy root louse, it doesn't exist. It can't, it's difficult for a lot for phylloxera to thrive on slate soils. So you do come across some of these producers having these parcels that go back to like the vines that go back to hundred years or older. They never had to regraft. That's kind of rare, but it exists. And I've actually read that it's illegal for them to, un, to, to not graft their vines or un, have ungrafted vines. So that's not the case, but it happens. Why is because phylloxera is difficult. It's difficult for them to survive or exist on these slate soils. Just how it's based and how crazy steep these slopes are. Again, a review and some of their major vineyards of the villages and base and where they're based, but you can see that it's all kind of spread throughout. A little look at their winemaking, ambient yeast, productive fermentation. Sometimes it's like a little matchsticky um, with some of their, because um, they bottle pretty early um, or they don't have a time and age to kind of soften out. They try to really keep that precision of fruit as the aim, the goal uh, in their winemaking. So sometimes it needs a couple of years. Um, for it to kind of pull off that reductive aroma, which is usually like this like match sticky plantiness to it. But they're so based up in Brunkhausen. Um, this is Egon Mueller, fourth generation here. Um, Egon, um, that was based in the Saar. Uh, Jean-Jacques Koch uh, purchased the Sartoff farm from the French Republic in 1797. I think this is that, um, result of the French Revolution, Napoleonic season, <laughs> all vineyards west of the Rhine, and then auctioning off vineyards from church and aristocrat into private ownership. I think that's what this is a strong representation of, like when does it actually make its way into family property, uh, but it has a long history going back uh, to 700 AD, where it would previously belong to a monastery for that all those years. Uh, and then John Jack, his daughter Elizabeth married Felix Miller, just one that actually took the name Miller um, starts off. This is that other property they own, the Galais, in that village of Canson. So it's not just Sharks off Bird, um, but they're known for. And just an example of some of their other uh, holdings. Again, VDP member, they grow only Riesling. That's kind of cool, but not super, super unique. This is their intense focus. Again, an example of the, the, the amount of the vineyard that they hold, the, the amount of property that they actually hold on, on the Chartoff Bar estate. So that's why we also see Van Volksum making wines um, from the Chartoff Bar, if that makes any sense. Um, just a, a kind of a breakdown of their holdings, if anything else, if it's a way of looking at that. Interesting that they only really started making Baron Offsley say and trucking Baron Offsley say. 1959 so i'll never see these late harvest examples from prior to this vintage um, unless we saw our kind of a focus for them fermented and aged fooder that's when i sh showed you that picture of what it looked like inside their cellar fooders are these large like neutral oak vessels that pull up to about uh, 1200 liters so it's just like these larger barrels so we met jojo's prune up in Brancastle, we stopped by Egon Mueller and the Saar with his famous Shard Southberg site. And now we're also in the Ruhr, where this is Kartoserhof. Again, that's a state that literally means Artusian, um, reminding ourselves of its monastery origins. And just to take a look at some of the labels there. Uh, today, Ludwig Brelling oversees the winery. It's been owned by this uh, Leonardy family. Um, for a long time, and I think I'm not totally sure exactly when, but it's been underneath this Leonardy uh, family for a number of years. If it wasn't during the time of uh, privatization, I suppose. But another BDP member, uh, again, just to look at their, if this is a monopole of theirs, and that they actually break this Kartoserhofberg village into smaller parcels uh, that might make its way onto top bottlings. 
Berg, Berg, you can then see that. So not only this village, they like to be more specific um, how they choose to bottle and release these wines. This is interesting and I didn't realize this. And you know what? You can buy a lot of old vine. You can buy a lot of back vintage wines from these that go back to like the 2000s and the 90s and they're pretty affordable. And that's just kind of cool to see like, I mean, Riesling produces some of the most age-worthy wines in the world and it's the city that back that gives it that backdrop. You might have said, remember hearing that even I think when uh, Amber talked about Schloss Schornborn and then having the wine from the 1700s that was um, recently sold at an auction or something like that. But it has that duration of time potentially behind these wines. But where Egon Mueller focuses on sweet examples, I didn't realize that Kartoserhof has a, such a high production focus on dry examples, especially based on the war where it's still um, pretty exceptionally cold. And then these were those two wines that were offered with class. Um, Marcus Molitor based um, he kind of has holdings without. He was one of the first to kind of go in the 20th century or here we have the 1980s when he was able to accumulate a lot of holdings because people were selling it for relatively cheap. So where they went from, gosh, where is it in front of me? Like over starting with 1.5 hectares over a 35 year period of time has grown over to 120 hectares. And it's kind of scattered throughout the most over overall family of holdings. But, um, probably one of the more influential producers of the last 20th century when you had these more established historic estates, Reichsgraf, Reichsgraf von Kasselstadt and Reinhold Hart, who's this young gun who's really starting to kind of reinvest in this area during the 20th century when at a time it was just so moving towards uh, conventional farming. Uh, you can see that this is a cabinet uh, where it would have a touch of sweetness and then you have Fritz Hogg as a reason chalk in a state that goes back to 1605. Oh, this is, this is what I wanna bring up real quick to take you a little bit longer. Remember when we were in Braunberg? There's a village that was previously known as Deucemount, but they remain, renamed it Braunberg, which means Brown Mountain to reference the color slate soils. Is that um, village in the Southern part of Burn Castle um, they renamed to help promote these world-renowned vineyards. And then the vineyards within them, remember we have Jufer, Jufer and Jufer son in our, but Jufer translates as old maid, which goes back to 1790. And the proprietor had three daughters who all remained unmarried and lived the lives of Spencer's vineyards treasured even by Napoleon. So Jufer meaning old maid, <laughs> so goofy, but it references these three daughters that were never married from the proprietor that had owned this property um, as late as the 18th century. Kind of goofy, but a little bit of a, some of the storytelling. Well, I'm glad he thought that was mildly amusing. There's lots of that here, <laughs> but I guess we did it. And we made it to the end of the slides. And we'll stop there. And you're very kind to stick with this. I know uh, with some of these in-depth classes, um, for us to cover our material um, and to not skip over things too much and um, that we can go a little bit longer. But well, uh, thank Adrian, thank you so much. And then, yeah, uh, thank you, Ryan. That was really interesting. And I really, I those vineyards blow my mind. I, it just, whenever I attend these classes, I get so excited just about the country and the region and wanting to just go and, and see and, and and learn more. So thank you very much. And I did, I, I think you asked in the beginning if I took the Bordeaux classes. Um, and I did, I took the Bordeaux classes. So those were super oh, cool. interesting as well. Yeah. So thank you very much. This was a great deep, deep dive. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Oh, and, um, yeah. Isn't it, isn't it that wild? Yeah. Again, you can try it like Franzen. It's F A R N Z E and uh -huh. Franzen. I'll type it up real fast. Like okay. you can try it. That's that Bremer Calmont, that's world's steepest vineyard where it's at a gradient of like 90%. Wow. And you can try that. And that's, that would, they release a Grosskavax, which would be a dry, um, dry example from a Grosslock Grand Cru site. Mm. It's like, gosh, you could probably, well, that's a little more expensive. That'd probably be 60 retail, but you can probably try like other releases from the Bremer like village. Okay. Some steep, steep areas that you can probably get for like twenty five dollars or less retail. Oh, that you sounds know, great. Just, 
Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of wild. Like Clemens Bush, all these people, like he's, it's just crazy what the work that goes into making some of these wines because you could just enjoy it. Like, oh, I like it. It's pretty and it's light and it's refreshing and it reminds me of stone fruit and it's a little floral. But then you're like, oh my gosh, like, who yeah. the hell is crazy enough to farm all this stuff? Like, right. The work uh, goes that goes behind it all. My gosh. Yeah. So I'm glad <laughs> that that's represented here and then that's translated in our efforts yeah. through these classes. But well, thank you. Um, and we'll send out the recording and the outline. And then um, uh, hopefully we'll, then we'll catch you here in the last couple classes here as we finish the spotlight series. But I'll Great. let you go and then you can enjoy, so you can enjoy the rest of the evening. All right. Well, thank you. You too. Take care. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye.